My Own Garms. What is happening, pals? I'm Thomas Griffin, and this is My Own Garms. This week's guest is one of the most requested by listeners. It is Mr. This Thing of Ours himself, Tim McTavish. For those of you who don't know, Tim owns and operates one of the world's best indie clothes shops right here in Manchester. He's got a real nose for what his discerning customer base wants to see and a passion for doing it properly. Everything about the shop is slick as fuck. Boss visuals and copywriting, killer products, passionate people, and they've always got decent tunes on. I'm buzzing to sit down with him today and find out a little bit more about the clothes that have shaped him and this thing of ours. Do you know where we're at on the socials? TikTok, Insta, X, YouTube, we are at my own garments. If you see a reel that makes you feel something, then stick it on your stories. Send it to your most popping WhatsApp groups shit at marketing and stuff like that so any help you can lend would be much appreciated anyway let's get into this episode it's ttoo's tim mctavish tim what's happening dude i'm good mate yeah, yeah. thank you a bit good knackered, we- but okay uh, that's kind of a constant at the moment yeah. but all good the day-to-day running the shop plus dad life uh, yeah, definitely more, probably more the shop, to be fair, okay. mate. I think the dad life bit is kind of restorative. To some extent. <laughs> yeah. The healing power believe of the child. It. Yeah, believe it or not, but yeah. It yeah. does give you life, doesn't it? I uh, got your WhatsApp number before and Tim's a bit of an enigma online. He only only appears to me through the, the shop channels, but the, the WhatsApp profile pic, popped up and it's a gorgeous pitch you and your son on holiday yeah, I think okay. man I was like yeah, oh probably. that's lovely mate lovely to see tell me about the new spot man how's it treating you it's good mate yeah really good it's been really nice to see so the reaction third iteration of physical space for this yeah thing has. yeah um I mean for those that don't know we started like four and a bit years ago now um container space so literally like a space not much bigger than this room that we're in now up on so, oxford road was uh yeah hatch so yeah. hatch was like uh what well, i say was because it's gone but like hatch was uh, one of the places in the city that was kind of encouraging independent businesses super flexible terms and stuff so mm. it was like a place where you could roll the dice and if your business didn't necessarily work out you could you could leave so yeah. it was a yeah a place that gave an opportunity to start something. Um, so yeah, super small space. We'd only been there like four months and the like the massive lurgy that was yeah, COVID man. started. So like everybody had to close. They had to close the whole site. And we kind of panicked for a little bit, moved everything into storage, ran the business from my apartment for a little bit and then um, took a space where we could use as like a photography studio where we could ship out orders from and stuff. So during COVID, we operated from there. And when like the government finally said we can kind of reopen as a shop, we just decided to stay. People came, um, which was nice. Um, it was small though, right? Uh, Physically. What, the, the first shop or the second? The first shop. The first shop was tiny. Yeah. Like Hatch was like, yeah, it's a, cont- a shipping container. So yeah. um had to be like super practical, loads of um, furniture that stored our stock and stuff like that. But yeah, it was a tiny store. Um, we maybe carried eight or nine brands at that time. Some that we still carry to this day and some that we were like, my first people to bring into the UK yeah. properly. So I think I bought a Native North t-shirt from there yeah. and it has aged impeccably. Okay, that's yeah. cool. Really, Good. really nice, like grey mile, dark grey mile yeah, yeah, yeah. one. But yeah. We still... don't work with them anymore, but no, like I can I... think of like when we opened um, Tillac, we had on the rails, uh, CMF, Comfy Outdoor Garments, we had on the rails, um, Outstanding Company, we had on the rails, like, that we that we still have on yeah. right now, yeah. like so. There's brands from those early days that have kind of been with us on that whole journey, yeah. and that's quite nice as well. Yeah, but the most recent expansion is the first one that's got a bit of kind of footfall. Is that uh, correct? Like the, the, no, the, the not the hatch, the hatch one did. But yeah, yeah, no, this, the, this. the last store was the last store, which was in like a loft space at the back of Piccadilly. Like we're a destination, and and one hundred yeah, percent we had people like come to seek us out and it always amazes us like we get people from all over the world that yeah. actually come to find us which is like like really heartwarming and like it blows our mind like even to this day mm. um but so that used to happen there but of course it was like you had to find us we were on the outskirts of the city center so i think we realized last year that we were as much as we were kind of uh 
operating well and it was working for us, we realized that we were making it hard for certain people. And so, yeah, more of a city center location became the Passing next Passing trade is what I meant rather than us. football. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think we're still, like, we still do something that is very niche within yeah. a much bigger part of, of the clothing industry, I guess. So, like, we, the, the customer that we're targeting is still quite niche, you know, they value quality, they are after something that is a little bit unique. They, you know, they're not, they're not just the average guy walking down the high street mm. looking for a shop to go in. So I think we still pride ourselves on being a little bit of a destination. We're off down a little side street. You still have to come and find us to some extent, um, but we're just making it easier. There's a customer who comes and sees us, like he used to come to the old space, and he would come consistently. And when I say consistently, I'd say like every six weeks. He's been in every weekend since we opened. And so it's kind of that, like just that thing of removing barriers for yeah. people. The people that want to come and see us, we've made it a lot easier for them to come and see us. And that's yeah, really man. nice. It's Plus we've had space, new people. Man. Yeah, love it's it. Gorgeous. Love it. Fell in love with the fascia, the outside. Like it's in a really nice part of town with... A lot happening at the moment. It historically was like the main shopping district in Manchester, okay. but then um, things kind of shifted and moved away after the bomb when mm. Selfridges and Harvey Nicks opened and everything. They kind of sucked people over that side of town. So it was a little bit unloved for a while, but it's got some amazing buildings, loads of old like carved sandstone exteriors and stuff. Um, and we've kind of managed to balance that with our kind of loft style space inside but with this kind of really ornate uh slightly grand exterior yeah which man. is pretty bizarre Looks but fly. um yeah i think we kind of managed that juxtaposition quite nicely Definitely. my mate gaz does a knife shop in ilkley called community cutlery uh similar to yours imports uh things that you can't get in this country many places and he's just taking his first trip to Japan and he, I was asking him about what retail was like over there and he said it's lots of the, th the thing that stuck out to him was like lots of small independent sellers passionate about what they do and that is pretty thin on the ground in this country I think um, but yeah. I know a lot of the brands that you get from over there was the kind of Japanese retail experience something that you'd been directly influenced by when yeah, you set 100%, this up. Yeah, 100%, mate, definitely. Like, I, I'm, I'm quite entrepreneurial and always have been. Like, I found myself in a pretty corporate job and for a while I'd been like, I want to do something different. I want to do something for myself. Um, never really buckled down what that needed to be or wanted to be. Um, but some trips to Japan definitely had an influence. Like, the thing that I love the most about Japan is that you can go into like a super small space. Like again, it could be smaller than a shipping container, um, but you step in and you smell the store, you hear the store, you live and breathe what that owner might be into. Mm. And he might be into 1930s Americano, or he might be into Gothic, uh, clothing or Gothic music or whatever, but you go in and you instantly know like, you yeah. almost know that guy's life story. And, and whilst that's not necessarily like exactly where we are, there's elements of that that we definitely like take as inspiration. And it 100% gave me the uh, confidence to say, okay, even if it's only a shipping container underneath a motorway in Manchester, uh, if I get it right, and if I get the feeling right, and I put my heart into it, then people will connect with it. And it doesn't have to be everyone that has to connect with it. But yeah. if I can make a niche audience connect with it, then we can make it work. And I think though, if I didn't have those trips to Japan, then maybe we wouldn't have seen, and maybe we'd have been stuck in this maybe UK type mentality of thinking like, oh, unless I can do it really big and bold that it isn't worth doing mm -hmm. when actually there, do something, focus on it, do it really well, and even if it's a small thing and you get enjoyment from it, then 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 do it to the best of your abilities. So, yeah, that's man. a big inspiration. Yeah. So, like, what things were you implementing to create that uh, independent, very true to yourself experience? Because first thing that I noticed when I went in is the music you were playing, and um, the new shop offered a nice filter coffee straight away. Like, 
Um, you mentioned the kind of smell of the place. Do you ever think about things? Do you like specific candles or anything like that? Do you really I kind of... I think we used to, mate. Yeah, like I, I don't feel like we overly analyse it or like, you know, I wouldn't say that we would go as far as having like a one particular scent that we only ever burn or yeah. whatever. Like it's it's more just about being true to us and how do we want the space to feel? I feel like the space is almost like an extension of an extension of our own like living space to yeah. some extent. Yeah. So yeah, we like to have a nice coffee. So of course there's nice coffee in the shop. Mm. If we go back to the original hat shop, then yeah, there was a, you know, there was a, a candle or some incense burning or whatever. Like it, there was things that we wanted to make ourselves feel comfortable in that environment. Yeah. And then hopefully the people that connect with us will also appreciate those things. There might be some people who come in and think, fuck, this stinks or whatever. <laughs> like, they, they, they get out of the shop, but I'm not bothered about impressing everybody or yeah. appealing to everybody. Yeah. It's never been the objective with this, yeah. with this business. Um, and I think that's a big difference from, for us versus some of the bigger businesses that do what we do in the UK is that they have to be focused on like appealing to as bigger audiences as possible. Mm. And for me, then they lose something, they get diluted, you know, if I was to shop with them, I have to step past a lot of things that I don't like to find the things that I do yeah. like. And that's, that's never really been the appeal for us. Rep your ends. Where about specifically are you from? How um, specifically? <laughs> how specifically? Like, I know kind of people that aren't from this country will probably say Manchester. Yeah. Whereabouts more specifically? I'm from, I'm a, from a small suburb called Ermston. Okay. Like, most people won't know it, but like... Um, it borders to Stretford. Maybe people who are in the football know Stretford because they'll have heard of the Stretford end. So, yeah. like, we're like five, ten minutes away from Old Trafford. Okay. Um, grew up in a small town called Hermston, yeah. What kind of clothes were you seeing around that area when you were younger? And where did you fit into <sighs> that kind of um, the, 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 the clothing styles of that place? Yeah, it's a mad one, mate, because I don't feel like I've ever followed, if that makes sense. And, that, and that's not said in a way to make me be like, oh, I'm this directional fashion guy, because that's not the case. Um, if you wanted me to kind of reference when did I first really like notice things that people were wearing, like yeah. I feel like I've always been into clothing, by the way, and I think that's something that was instilled by my parents. 100% I have memories of going to Manchester with my mum and dad, like mm. them making sure I was dressed up and them taking me shopping to places, like even from being like five, six years old, I remember that clearly. Um, but at that age, I wouldn't have remembered what other kids or peers were okay. wearing, right? I feel like probably the first time that I can think back now and really remember what other people were wearing would have been kind of late 80s early 90s and I would have been a kid but I remember the older kids yeah uh, like played a lot of sport I played cricket and lacrosse so like local cricket club had a load of young lads 18 19 20 when I would have been 11 or 12 and I can remember those lads uh finishing a game on a Saturday baggy jeans Russell Athletic, okay. feelers on, whatever, <laughs> yes, yeah. Mate. And I can remember them disappearing mm. on a Saturday. They were obviously going to raves and stuff, but yeah. this was not on my like consciousness yeah. at that time. And I can remember them returning on the Sunday morning, bleary eyed. They'd probably been <laughs> up all night and they were like ready to play another game on the Sunday, like probably still <laughs> off the heads. To be young again, man. Yeah, probably still <laughs> off their heads. But like, I think that was the first time I really noticed like the baggy jeans the feelers, like the Russell Athletic sweats, yeah. like that whole kind of baggy Manchester kind of vibe that was around at that time for all those lads go, lads and girls going off to like raves and stuff Very like that. So man. Yeah, like, cause it, that definitely made an impression, but I wasn't part of it, do you know mm. what I mean? Like it wasn't me living that, it yeah. was, so it, it made an impression in terms of like seeing what they were wearing. I remember seeing the first kid that I, 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 I know. first kid that I saw wearing that kind of thing and I can remember precisely where it was and it was like a, a fucking apparition from another galaxy man like this kid I, I was top year at primary school so 10 or 11 years old yeah. and a kid turned up um, Patrick O'Keefe he was called he was Brendan O'Keefe's big brother and he 
just looked so busy. Just the, the folds in him, the layering that he was wearing. It looked like he had trainers beamed from Mars, man. <laughs> and honestly, it's the bottom of the path at St. Mary's Primary School. I can still see him. Uh, and it's probably the first time I ever noticed yeah. clothes, like any clothes. And it was just because it was so weird and out of place in the town that I came from. But it stuck with me. And a lot of the kind of silhouettes that you wear and that you stock now have that same kind of like shape to them. Um, yeah, we're a similar age, right? The, I think so. I'm 38, me. Yeah, well, I'm definitely older than you, but I feel like kind of experiencing those kind of silhouettes and stuff. They've always, in fact, the the, the looser uh, layered shapes and, and aesthetics have probably formed like pretty key moments in the time where I would have been influenced by fashion, but yeah. at different at different points as well. It's almost like when those key things come back around, I'm very much kind of to the front of the queue with my hand up. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, like outside of that, I feel like the first time that I would have personally got into really into what I was wearing was influenced by like American sports. Like I mentioned that I played lacrosse and like I didn't really look to the UK, my eye was like firmly on the US. Okay. And so like... What is the lacrosse look? Or is it like a collegiate kind of like... I uh, think, it, I don't feel like it's like necessarily like the lacrosse look, but I feel like for me at that time, playing lacrosse, um, mesh shorts, sweatshirts, mm. like Nike cleats, like the, the worlds of like basketball, American football and lacrosse are all like heavily like merged together, I guess, yeah. in terms of aesthetic. Yeah. And I think that's where like a first love of like American sportswear, like heavy sweats, you know, uh, baggy sweats, mesh shorts, obviously like Nike footwear and, and like American footwear that would come through at the time as well. So basketball shoes. Uh, yeah, basketball shoes, but like obviously we played on grass as well, so you needed like something like yeah. cleats, yeah. boots yeah. basically. Um, but that whole aesthetic was probably pretty formative for me. And like I think from like the age of like 12, 13 through to like 16, maybe I played longer. But like if you'd have found me outside of school or whatever, generally that's what I'd be wearing. I'd be wearing some form of like American sportswear. You Which has a hip hop influence as well, I guess. Yeah, yeah, defo. You mentioned your mum and dad um, kind of being being stylish, having an interest in clothes. First of all, tell me a little bit about what they wore, if you don't mind. And oh, then, man, do you know what? They... Like, I'm terrible. I'm not one of those. Like, you obviously like have an amazing I like this, memory. Man, like, weird. I don't have a good memory for many things, but that's one of them. But go I on, think sorry. in many like in many things for me, uh, and I don't know if this is a benefit at some point for stuff. I feel like I'm somebody who just like skims all this data and like takes in so much stuff, but remembering details of like individual, like specifics of stuff, I've never been that good at, but I kind of soak all this data in and I feel like what I am good at with that is then uh, working out or realizing where things might be heading going oh, forward. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, like does, totally. picking up on little uh, notes. But if you were to like ask me like, you know, who produced your favorite song or something mm. like I might know the song, yeah. but like, and yeah. I know I love it, but yeah. I'm not going to be able to break down all those individual levels yeah. of detail. So mum and dad, like, I think one of the things that I would say is that maybe similar to myself is that their style evolved and like was, they're not, they're not somebody who uh, still has the same haircut from like when they were 17 or like you could recognize them across a room 20 years later by what they were wearing. Yeah. I think that's that was quite informative for me in that like things evolve, things move forwards and I don't think they've ever been people to kind of stand still. The house would not look the same. You know, yeah. you know what I yeah. mean? Like I they would mean, redecorate man. every three or four years. Like it's that kind of like evolution, that moving forwards, yeah. I think is uh, part, it was definitely part of my childhood, but they weren't, it's not like I can turn around and say, oh yeah, my dad was a mod or like, yeah, it's not yeah. really like how they were. Um, it's that will to change that you've inherited more than I anything else. I think so, mate, yeah. yeah that nice kind one. of uh, appreciation of change and that kind of, uh, 
yeah, that openness to change, which I think is, is interesting. In my industry, there's a lot of people who are like collectors and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think the mindset that comes with somebody who is like a collector is very much like, uh, it's almost like a museum curator. And like, you're so into the knowledge and the detail of those individual pieces. And I feel like that's almost the opposite of, of what I'm about. Like, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with it. And I think we need both of those kinds of people. But um, I feel like that curator aspect almost leads you to be a little bit rooted in something that you believe in and it doesn't allow you to move forwards as much mm. as you might like to. And I think some stores in the UK in the past have fallen victim to that a little bit, to be honest. Yeah, you know, that lack of opportunity to kind of move away from what you're really known for, I guess. Let's move a little bit further afield from our home. Was, I think I remember hearing you saying on the um, Trees and Nylon podcast, shout out Trees and Nylon, that your kind of family holidays when you were younger were very local holidays around but um, yeah, to more, a certain extent yeah more Scotland. East, my dad's Scotland. Scottish so I'm, okay. I'm I'm at Tavish so like yeah, yeah. my dad's Scottish as as uh, yeah my dad was born in Glasgow so okay plenty of trips up to Scotland and stuff but when you first started to travel like holidays before maybe you were doing it for business over to Asia yeah. did you visit anywhere that you found particularly inspiring for clothes around the world ah man um when I first started to travel, no, I did the typical lads things that a okay. northern that a northern lad does, right? Like first lads holiday Shagalove. would have been to Magaluf or whatever. Like, but clothing even then was like important for me as part of that. I think I was the guy in the group of like six, seven lads that even my biggest mate who might be like six foot three and like two stone heavier than me would be like trying to borrow my shirt or, <laughs> or like, you know, take something out of the wardrobe. So I think, I think even from one. then, like there was a um, at least amongst that friend group there was a there was a difference between how I dressed and how like the rest of my friends dressed 100% I would and I never looked to see the photos I'll let you have a look at them mate. but <laughs> and I never looked at and I never I never looked to them or to any I don't feel like I looked to anyone locally in order to influence my own aesthetic, if that makes sense. I think I've always been influenced by things a little bit further yeah. afield and things that felt a little bit more exotic than, yeah. than, than, than what was available to me locally, although I did shop locally. so. Could you maybe tell us about some of the brands that really caught your eye, that exoticism really shone out early for you? Because we're talking 20 years ago now. Yeah. When I guess you've- <laughs> Was it, Easily. Was there... I mean, they wouldn't sound exotic now, and that's the interesting thing, right? Yeah. So I'm, I've been quite fortunate that um, when I finished school and was kind of starting uni, like I've been quite fortunate to work in retail in some great stores. Yeah. Um, my first job ever, like retail job, was with Diesel. Like, and although that brand may have a different image right now, like twenty odd years ago, at that point, it was like really driving things forward yeah. and was like a really uh, highly regarded brand. From there, I also worked in flannels when it was an independent store. So when it was still owned by like one family in Manchester, mm. like it stocked CP, Stony, Prada Sport. Like it was like a real uh, innovator. Yeah. And the same again, I also worked at Aspecto and, you know, those guys were like really responsible for driving forwards brands like Stussy in the UK. Like they had a downstairs section in the basement where I was when the Manchester bomb went off. I was shopping. Uh, for a, oh, come on. I was shopping for a Magaluf trip right? <laughs> <laughs> with my with my mum. Um, yeah, like they had a downstairs section that was just one hundred percent Stussy t shirts. Yeah. So, and across the road was a store called Richard Krem that, like, probably most people younger than me won't remember. Like, no way could I have ever shopped there. But he was like an innovator for the UK at the time. He was one of the first people, if not the only person. I, I'd have to fact check that, but like. Yoji Yamamoto, Isimiyaki, like this was, he was the guy. Yeah. Um, so kind of seeing those stores and like operating around them and stuff, like that 100% has had an impact and uh, formed That was the cruise. some kind of outlook in terms of like, yeah, how those stores operate, what they do, um, who they appealed to at the time as well, I guess. You mentioned Prada Sport in there. Yeah. Um, I think I heard you talk about... Uh, your experience at university and yeah. how maybe Prada Sport played quite a role in, was it 
was that what you're wearing or was that a particular design inspiration? No, I think uh, that was a, like, it's a really interesting time for me. Like I worked at Flannels um, and kind of swapped between the Flannel store and the Life store. I don't know if you remember Life, but don't. basically like Life was their store that they had around the corner and they used to have all of like the Stony CP, like this is 20 odd years ago. Um, so they used to have all that in that store. And then in Flannels was more of the like traditional big fashion houses yeah. before anyone else kind of had them in Manchester. So that was the only place you could buy Prada, Gucci, Miu Miu, like yeah. all of those kind of brands. Um, and Prada, so I was in the flannel store, but maybe like kind of liked the stuff in life a little bit more. Okay. So that time was really interesting when Prada dropped Prada Sport because before that, Prada would have never necessarily been a brand for, for me, but then all of a the sudden there was all of this Gore-Tex technical outerwear. Like, I think it was really one of the first high fashion brands to really like embrace that kind of sporting mm. aesthetic. Um, the ones with the little like long red tap yeah. down it. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I spent my first student loan on a on a jacket on my staff <laughs> discount. So like that did not go on books. It went on a Prada Sport jacket that I own to this day. I bought a Jag Prada Sport full like kind of loop back tracksuit on eBay in about two thousand and three, two thousand and four, and. Uh, it was baggy. It, it looked cool, man. It was a yeah. decent dupe. Like, and I went in my back garden with my mate John Lee, and I was doing back somersaults on my trampoline. In it. <laughs> Did a shit back somersault, landed one leg off, one leg on, and put my hand in a dog shit from no. <laughs> from palm to fucking armpit and smeared it up me. Um, fake Prada tracksuit, man. Right. I had to like fucking bin it straight away. That was that was karma from the fashion gods <laughs> for buying fake for buying Fugazi gear, wasn't it? I was young, man. I didn't know. I, I thought I didn't know if fake stuff existed. I was just yeah. overwhelmed by the the horizons that eBay had opened up to me. Yeah. But, uh, and plus, I couldn't afford one when yeah. I was sixteen. I don't think I would have if it wasn't for good old student loans. Yeah, so man. I probably took me like <laughs> twenty years to pay it off. But yeah. <laughs> back from those exotic Italian brands we've just been discussing yeah. and bringing it a bit close to home a recent collaboration you've done with Macintosh is a decidedly northern affair mm. the picks for that were incredible tell us a little bit about that Thanks, um, collaboration um, so we've actually done two with them now, okay. but I'm guessing you're talking about the most the most recent one, right? The but billowing jumping like across the rocks. I feel like the we've done for both of them were awesome, to be fair. Like, right. um, Anthony did the ones for the first shoot and uh, we worked with a with another French photographer for the, the more recent ones. I think like most things for us, like it's kind of been organic. So um, the Macintosh guys reached out. They're uh, from where specifically? North I mean, London. originally they're a Scottish biz based business, right? Like they invented the Macintosh, yeah. like that's why it's called yeah. a Mac, right? Yeah. So like raincoat type sealed rubberized garments, they were the ones that like invented that. Yeah. And they reached out to us. They have a very like traditional um, image in the UK, and they reached out to us because they wanted to tap into like a fresher perspective. Yeah. And they really liked the fact that we were based locally. They have a factory up at Nelson. Nelson. Um, so they really liked the idea, and they floated the idea to us of like working with them on something that was yeah, designed and, and made in Lancashire. So. It was quite nice. Um, obviously flattering for us. They've worked with some amazing people. So even just to be like asked to do that, you know, they've worked with Jill Sander, Cold Wall, like I, I can't name them all, but there's a load of people that they've worked with that yeah. are like serious heavy hitters. So for them to ask us was really nice. It gave me a chance to flex some long lost uh, design skills. And yeah, it's been really nice like process, really good people to work with, a really great response to the collection like it was never about shifting huge numbers it was about changing perspectives yeah. for them and uh and also kind of doing something interesting and creative for us but it was really nice and really well received some like i can't mention the names but some nice people picked up pieces that bought them out of their own pocket and that was like a nice rubber stamp for me so kind of knowing that we reached those people was was quite nice people that whose opinion i respect so that was good sick man yeah congrats on that <laughs> On me. Uh, I think we're not too dissimilar in age, as we've ascertained. Yeah, I'm older. Um, <laughs> we entered our teens in an age that just kind of predates the internet. 
yeah. don't know when was your when did your family first get dial up modem oh man I, like i said I'm, I'm not one for details but i can definitely remember the whole yeah, 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 yeah. just to get one picture <laughs> thing down but Same, yeah mate. are there any clothing eras that you look back on and think what was i playing out there mm. um Again, like I had said before, like I don't feel like I've ever been somebody who um, goes, "Oh, this is hot right now," so I've got to be, I've got to be a part of that. Mm. Um, I think, like naturally, I feel better and I feel more comfortable and I feel more like me when shapes and silhouettes are more relaxed. So okay. that whole kind of like end of nineties, no, end of two uh, thousands, like early, like late noughties where everything started to go slimmer and it was like maybe kind of being led a little bit more by like the whole indie thing that was going on in the UK at the time, that yeah. whole kind of like Shoreditch aesthetic. Mm. Like 100% my silhouettes would have got like slimmer at that time. I don't think I ever did the whole like spray on thing, yeah. but I would have been definitely like wearing like slimmer shapes and plimsolls and like cardigans and stuff and I just don't feel like it ever felt like natural for me like it didn't feel normal yeah. so for me I feel like I always feel more myself when like silhouettes are looser shapes are bigger yeah and there's more layering involved definitely so there was yeah. a time when the whole Hoggy indie G sleeves thing yeah. yeah but it was it was everywhere and a baggy jean was a thing of ridicule. Oh, 100%. Um, I don't think you would have been, you would have actually like struggled to buy them. And I think that would have been before being able to look easily at other markets and see what was happening there. So yeah. I think that's an interesting thing, like versus where we are now. In the past, people were very much influenced by what was around them. And I feel like that's one of the best things that like current generations have and like my generation living in this time has is that if you don't like what's happening in your own market, there's a million and one other markets out there for you to have a look at and see what's going on. Right. Yeah. So if you like something that's happening in, I don't know, in, in Cape town, then fuck it. Where what's happening in Cape town? If that's what you like, like don't be bound in by everyone in my area is a teddy boy. So now I've got to dress like a teddy boy. <laughs> like that's what would have happened in yeah, the past, yeah. right? Like they would have been ridiculed for not fitting in at the pub. And I think, that's an interesting thing now that I don't think has to be the case. Social media has a lot of downsides, but I think it's one of the upsides is that it opens up new worlds to people, For whether real. they're good or bad, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I believe you studied clothing design at university. Did Badly. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I just messed around too much. Like if I look back, like I was clubbing at the same time and like I... I barely finished my course like yeah. uh, I fucked off to a beefer for a summer and like it's just that so time in your life changed. not ready to do it oh 100% not ready to do it like I had too many other things that I wanted to do and that was why I didn't go into anything remotely associated with clothing after after uni yeah. like did anything that you picked up on the course give you a kind of grounding a deeper understanding of the kind of technical elements and an appreciation um of what you do today when you're buying and selecting stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's not a lot that I can remember off that course. There's a lot of partying at that time. Yeah. Um, I, I think the bizarre thing is probably the tailoring aspect of the course. Mm. Uh, it was a bit that I hated the most at the time. Like, you know, hand, uh, hand basting like chest panels into suit jacket that you were making as part of your course. Did like, it just seemed very like oh, yesterday kind laborious of Laborious and like, yeah, it just wasn't what I wanted to get into that course for. Yeah. It was an element of the course that I didn't like, but when I look back, it's probably the part of the course that I remember the most, that and right. pattern cutting. And it's probably the part of the course that gives me some background and some insight when I'm, even if I'm looking at a CAD drawing from a, from a brand like for those that don't know, that might literally just be a design drawing. Yeah. If I'm working with a brand that's based in Japan, I might not always get to physically touch that product. So I can get sent a CAD drawing. And I think if I hadn't have done that course, looking at that CAD drawing, I might really misjudge what that product's going to look like in real life. But having done pattern cutting and having understood that tailoring aspect, I feel like I have a better understanding as to how it's going to wear. 
yeah, that only, that has to be an advantage, I think. Sick. I look forward to the future where we can just digitally try things on yeah. and step into a world and I see I mean, that's them. there, right? That's there right now in, for some stores, I think. Like I'm sure some, you'll be the first to do it. I don't know. I don't know <laughs> if it feels uh, too impersonal for us, okay. I think, to be honest. But yeah, I think it's that's probably something that the bigger guys will jump on because they'll want to reduce their return rate by 0.5% or whatever. <laughs> it's not how we think about yeah. things like yeah. a, the personal approach and like having someone in the store and being able to speak with them and being able to help them out is probably the way that we'd prefer to go. I know the stuff that you stock is quite broad um, and you obviously a head to toe in stuff that you stock I <laughs> at the think, moment everything. yeah unfortunately yeah um, do you like to buy stuff anywhere else any vintage stuff you got any interesting things that you you will never get into your own shop yeah it's hard isn't it like i think we're like i i challenge myself on this all the time i, I live in a, a a bubble of like this abundance of product and actually it changes how you feel about product i feel i buy way less for myself personally right now because I have this abundance of product around me and I almost live vicariously through other people's choices. Yep. I really enjoy seeing someone like find something that they really like and buzz okay. off and walk out the store. That almost gives me the same sense of enjoyment as if I'd have found and bought something for myself. Yeah. It sounds like bizarre me even saying it, like I hear the words, but but it's true. What a wonderful thing to be then to one of the ones a shop, like you're getting that kick on a May, daily. yeah it's great i think like that genuine feeling or of when like you see someone like absolutely like buzzing because they found that jacket and like walked out the shop with it and i think because the stuff we stock is so niche and there isn't that much of it about like that genuinely happens quite regularly mm. that they're just like wow i've never seen anything like this and like you know, they know they can't walk into another shop and yeah. and get it and they're they're over the moon. For me on a personal level, I don't shop too many other places, but you touched on vintage and it probably is the one thing that I would say over the last couple of years that I have picked up elsewhere. And it tends to be American sportswear focused. So like windbreakers and, and hats and stuff that like, and again, I know are going to be one-offs and I know yeah. I'm not going to be able to find them. So it's about um, that rarity, that having something that someone else hasn't got kind of thing yeah i think it's just about having something that touches a, a nerve for me in terms of like nostalgia yeah. and i think it's reliving those elements of your youth to some extent i think the last piece like that that it won't be the last piece that i bought but it's the last piece that like really sticks out in my memory is um in Korea, I picked up a Nike windbreaker. It's like a black V-neck windbreaker. You can throw a hoodie underneath it, like that classic sportswear vibe. It, but it's it's a Nike one, but it's been over embroidered with uh, a team logo of literally just some like small local team in America, like something Bulldogs. I don't even remember the area. It's like a yeah. small town, yeah. and so. It's pieces like that that Sick, like man. that's unique. That's unique, and even it's even more unique because at the time I was buzzing over it so much in this shop in Korea that I didn't realize that they'd Frankenstein some of it. So <laughs> when I got it home, I realized that they'd actually taken a made in US label out of another Nike product and put it in that, so it made it look like it was a better piece than it was. Okay, but that's kind of like in a bizarre way, it's almost part of the story for me finding man. that garment. Definitely, so, yeah. Something to, I mean, if you're a clothing fan it's all about the stories and if you're talking to other fans of it then regaling them with them kind of tales is is part of it yeah it was part. blatantly like a you know made in china windbreaker but they'd restitched the label in so it made it look like it was a like a more classic piece but Sick. it's definitely part of the story gotta uh, have, you gotta admire the ingenuity though yeah definitely <laughs> yeah they, they they got me big time but i think i love it i love the piece and uh, genuinely that kind of like it adds to it for me i wouldn't i wouldn't have it any other way so nice man top three selected the shop for me is synonymous with hip-hop the music that you're playing in there is every time I've been in, it's always been 95%. Yeah, big L, gangsta, yeah, primo yeah, produced. Yeah, I would like your top three best dressed hip hop artists, yeah. please. I feel like this is a really hard one, mate, because I, f I, I don't, I'm not speaking out of turn, but I feel like everybody in hip hop, even people that I like really love, 
I feel like they're all guilty of committing some absolute <laughs> fashion atrocities at some point, right? Like there's people who I could call out at one era and be like, I love how they dress then, mm. but they will have committed some atrocity along the way. And I think for me, hip hop, like pre, pre, P. Diddy and pre big money mm. was a completely different animal than it was after that. So um, you kind of had that era before in like the 80s where it was all like fur coats and like dapper dance suits and yeah. all that kind of stuff. The era that I like the most is the one straight after that, where that that generation that came after, like the big daddy canes of this world, was almost like the, they wanted the complete opposite. So they were like Timberlands, fatigues, hoodies, M65 jackets, mm. butter leathers, like yeah. it, that kind of grimy New York, New York like yeah. 91, 92. And I feel like you could throw a dart at a board with 15 artists on and they would have all dressed impeccably during yeah. that time. But then like once it kind of drifted into big money time, 95, 96, 97, it kind of changed the landscape. So for me, like if you picked anyone like Nas, Guru, uh, Das FX, uh, Lords of the Underground, like if you picked any of those guys at that time, like 91, 92, Timberlands, Baggy Fatigues, Baggy Denim, Blue Carhartt Jackets, yeah, like workwear, yeah. heavy, heavy sweats, that kind of, it just had that industrial rugged, Appeal, loose fits, like that's a period. And I feel like those artists in that time were kind of, will always kind of shine out to me. And, and still massively influential today. Yeah, definitely. But like there's periods for each one of those people that I've mentioned where, you know, you could take it another five years into the future and they would be wearing something horrendous, yeah. right? So um, yeah, for me, it's more about being able to pick a moment in time for those okay. people than those people as as individuals. Well, we won't find Like Fat Joe, right? Like, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> come on, here's a perfect example, isn't it? Like, it must be difficult to dress yourself when you wear 40 stone. Yeah, but if you would look at that period, like, I feel like you could look at a video at that period and you'd be like, yeah, solid. Like, again, simple sweats, M65, oversized denims. Yeah. Like, and then fast forward five, 10 years and he's drawing on his beard and he's like, pink furs or something like something weird happened to hip hop when the big money came along and yeah. it became a little bit twisted in the fashion aspect I feel the drawn that's a on, personal opinion yeah, it sounds like yeah. an old man's opinion <laughs> <laughs> the drawn on beard is something I'm not going to get used to I don't think it's crazy it's, it? <laughs> it's so weird man yeah. how can you not think people are going to know like yeah. it's gross Yeah. Um, maybe that's a massive cultural uh, <laughs> faux pas for me to say but still and continuing on the hip hop theme I think the kind of healthy one-upsmanship you get in hip-hop culture mm. is quite evident in what you do. Uh, like always being ahead of the curve, always being the flyest. Is that kind of creative competitiveness something that drives you forward? Mm. I'm competitive 100%, but I feel like I'm more competitive with myself. Okay. Like so You're trying to one-up what you've done previously. I think it's like an athlete's mentality. It's okay. like I'm training and I need to be better than I am now this time next year. Or like I'm in, an I'm in a cycle for an event and I'm like, I've got the Olympics in four years and each year I need to make improvements so that I get to that pinnacle wow. and then I start again. And, and I your sport myself. is gums. I feel, yeah, to some extent, it's just, I think like I'm 100% I'm competitive. I'm competitive in my life outside of, whether that's sports or whatever. Um, but I don't feel like I look to others. And I think that's an interesting thing for me, like even through the conversation that we're having when you've asked about like, what were people wearing and stuff? I just don't feel like I look to others that much mm. to, I must take influence from somewhere, yeah. but I don't feel like I'm acutely aware of seeing others and feeling like, oh, they've done that, so I must do this. There's more of a direction that's already in my head of where I want things to go and um, I'm, like I said, I, I scan that data and bring all that stuff in and form a path, but it's not like I'm like zoned in on anyone. I think one of the things that I would be brutally honest about that does make me competitive versus others in like what we do is this feeling or understanding that most of them nowadays at least are doing what we do with a way bigger team and a way bigger budget because 
Most of them are stock market listed companies or bigger companies behind the scenes, even some of the ones that look like independents. So that kind of personal knowledge or like drive of like, we're a really small team. We started it from nothing and, you know, we are still a really small team but we're, we're leading the pack to some Real extent in certain, in certain areas, like that's motivation. It's like, okay, fine. Maybe you might mimic some things, but yeah, we're, it pushes us on to know that there's this team of 15, 20 people that are napping at our heels, but like it keeps us fresh. It keeps us kind of trying to stay ahead of the pack, I guess. Yeah, man. We touched on it in the bonus section, but I think one of the things that does set you apart and that you are top of the pile in is the visuals. Um, obviously, the products that you stock are dope, but the way they're presented on the site and the socials is just next level. Is that a part of it you particularly enjoy? Tell us a little bit about the team, the tiny team and the process yeah. for making that stuff. I mean, it's definitely a part of it we enjoy. Yeah. Like, I think I mentioned to you before, both uh, myself and the photographer that we work with, Anthony, like we have a great working relationship. Mm. Like it's one of those weird relationships now where like I don't think, like I said, I don't think we could recreate everything that we do with Anthony and I don't think he could recreate everything he does with us. There's this sometimes unspoken uh bonds the wrong word there's this there's this unspoken knowledge of like i'll move to do something just as he asks me to do it like it's 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 kind of like that now it's yeah. weird um so i think we both challenge each other and that relationship is a big part of what you see on the visuals um a lot of the direction 100 percent kind of is from within my own head but i feel like that's true for most of the stuff for mm. the store from the fit out of the new shop, you know, through to like how we're perceived on socials, the brands that we stock, you know, yes. it is slightly more of a personal vision at this point. And it won't always be that way. Hopefully we'll grow the team, but like it's more of a personal vision at this moment in time, I think. Yeah. Before we started rolling, you were telling me about the kind of accidental factors that played into the aesthetic, like the, the, the side lighting that you had on the early shots was not a uh, purposeful um, artistic decision but something that you were working with in the confines of what you had yeah. and you just realised looked dope and now you see it everywhere I think it's really interesting isn't it like for me um, and it's hard for me to say these things sometimes because it sounds big headed yeah. like, but you know other people notice it and mention it to us as well. And I think like we, when we started, we made a lot of decisions based around the fact that we didn't have any other choices. You know, we shot a particular way because there was a window in our studio that meant that the light hit a certain way at a certain time of day. And then to see uh, images start to recreate that look to some extent in terms of the lighting placement and stuff, it wouldn't be something that everyone would notice, but for like, fellow creatives or photographers yeah. and stuff they would notice it mm. and like say oh, have you seen these guys have switched up their shooting it looks just like yours and these guys had big budgets they had all of the tools available to them but they were recreating stuff that we did just purely because we had no other option and I think that's been really interesting for us but we continue to do some of those things but I think sometimes having less resource forces you to be more creative. And yeah. I think that's the, that's the nice thing about it. Like even the fact that I'm in the Instagram posts, like that's not by desire or design. Like it was there because it saved us money on like having somebody else come in, like, you know, and gave us flexibility on when we shot. We, we've kept it because it's worked for us yeah. so far, but it was something that was born out of necessity. And I think that's true for a number of things within the business. Um, but that it makes us be more creative, yeah. which is, I think, the crux of things, right? Yeah, and again, bakes that personal aspect into the the store, into what you do. It's you, it's it's your taste. Yeah. And it's all part of the same whole. I think. People ask that question quite a lot at the moment, like, well, why don't you step out? And, you, you know, you could do this instead while you get somebody else in to do this or whatever. And I don't even mean step out, like we couldn't afford to do it financially, but I just mean like be on the other side of the camera or yeah. give some more creative direction from that side and stuff. But I, I just don't feel like the formula would be the same. Like yeah. I'm, I, I also don't want to tinker too much with stuff that kind of works yeah. for us right now. You so. look fucking great on it, man. Like, Thank you, man. It's always like try to 
hide as much of you're a you're an athlete dude like I, I think you'd struggle to find a model that can leap between rocks the way that you can and <laughs> float through the air and, it shouldn't and, and be about me like it should be about like the shoes. store and the clothing i think that's yeah. always been like a guy said something to me once which which i really liked and it was a friend of uh it was a friend of my wife's his husband was like i've never looked at someone so much online and could have walked past you in the street and not known it was you mm-hmm. and that was really nice because actually for me that's exactly what we wanted to achieve yeah. like i want to step in and and be able to fulfill the role but it needs to be about this thing of ours and not mm-hmm. about about, this not thing about of me mine. basically yeah, yeah yeah exactly nice man Tell us what's next for you, Tim. Now you've got the new store in town. Have you got anything exciting in the pipeline? In store pod- podcast recordings, anything like that? <laughs> we, we won't do that to you. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, like uh, there's loads, mate. I, I don't know like how much we can yeah, kind of say awesome. right now because there's projects that we're working on that are really nice and. And there's one that I'd love to be able to tell you personally about because I've heard people on your podcast reference something along these lines a couple of times and it's something that's true to my own heart that we're we've got in the pipeline for next year but um like plenty of new brands i feel like we bring on like two to three new brands a season and hopefully for the most part they will be brands that um we still continue to drive change and Mm -hmm. and drive like uh, new ideas into the marketplace um it's still bedding into the new store mate like it's only been 12 weeks and there are things that we're finding out about how that works and how that operates but it feels like it's also opened us up to a completely new world in terms of uh, like the level of visibility that we have right now not only for customers but also for brands i think there's a lot of bigger brands that have gone oh crap actually they've now got a city center store like yeah. we need to take them even more serious yeah. whatever so um there's some people that have reached out with some great projects and hopefully we'll bring some of those to fruition and maybe i can come back and talk to you about them in the future but like yeah some good stuff happening mate definitely. big moves man and your little ray of sunshine your respite your where you work um get away from the store i wouldn't always say that about him mate but All yeah right. go on Dad life. How's yeah. he got his first pair of hokers? He hasn't, mate. Do you know what? Like we're we're pretty down to earth on that. Like he he probably dresses better than I did at that age. He wears a like, so typical. Like he wears a lot of like sweats, US sports where he gets sent a few little bits from some of our suppliers, which is really okay, nice. Cute. Shout out to Merv uh, Maranan uh, from Found Feather. I don't know if you've seen Found Feather's no, hats in the store, but he also produces like kid sizes and they're incredible, made in Japan. And he sent over some hats for him at the moment. So his hat game's impeccable at the minute. But a footwear, he, he, he rocks New Balance, mate, but he rocks New Balance <laughs> because he, does. Uh, uh, he rocks New Balance, but no hokers yet. Okay. okay. <laughs> Christmas okay, round okay, the corner. can send them in. Yeah, man. Hook us up. Um, last question for you. On a scale of one to ten, how much do you care about clothes? Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's 52 and sometimes it's one. Like, yeah. there is no consistency for me. Like, okay. I'm not... Uh, I, I don't plan out. I don't like... I'm not the guy that plans outfits. Okay. And again, like I said, there needs to be both types of people. Like, I know you've had people on the podcast that, like... 100% that's a big part of their enjoyment from mm. clothing like unless I had a big event to go to like I'm I'm the guy that literally like grabs stuff in the morning and puts it together like super quickly um but I like and appreciate what I have in the wardrobe so I know that they work together does that make sense so I don't feel like I need to spend time planning etc um so yeah sometimes it's sometimes it's super high and sometimes it's sometimes it's zero. Like mm. sometimes it's just let me throw on a pair of sweats and and knock about the house. But I think that's more healthy, yeah, and balanced, yeah. right? Like there's bigger things in in life than garms. That's something that's true for us as a store as well. Like I love making that connection with people, but also if something's not right for someone, like they should leave it and move on and come back another day because there'll be another jacket for them. Like might be a weird thing for a retailer to say, but I'd actually prefer somebody to be like, no, that's not for me, than buy something, go away and, and regret it. So like, I think in a time where we probably all should be a little bit more conscious about what we buy, 
I'd prefer that customer to wait and come back and get that piece that like really blows them away. And hopefully kind of we give them the opportunity to do that. Lovely place to leave it. Thanks a million for doing it, man. No, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Cheers, man. Boom. How'd you like that one then? Tim McTavish, top, top bloke, top ebb. Thanks to him for making the time to come and record. And if you're ever in Manchester City Centre, then go and give him a shout at the This Thing of Ours shop. Proper, proper gear. Now, making this podcast costs a small fucking fortune. I love doing it, but it'd be ace if it didn't eat up all my spare cash and if I could pay all the other people who've helped out a nice wage. So if you want to advertise on here, reach out to us on the socials and I'll give you my proper a business email address imagine me reading your ads out with the same dynamism and vim as this pre-written outro you know it'll pay you about tenfold in brand kudos enough of the admin i'll let you go thanks a million for being here it means the world we'll be back soon with another episode My mind is